Oh, friends, this is Jim here with Science Talk, and in this uh, video here, I want to share with you uh, an abstract from an article that was just published uh, second half of October of 2022, and um, appeared in the journal JGR Oceans, which is the Journal of Geophysical Research. Observations of modified warm deep water beneath the Rhone ice shelf in Antarctica from an autonomous underwater vehicle. Okay, and you see there's several folks that uh, were part of this investigation, part of the authorship of this article, with uh, Peter E. D. Davis being the lead uh, PI. Let's take a look at the abstract and uh, look at the abstract, key points, and then a plain language uh, abstract. The Filchner Rhone Ice Shelf, FRIS, F R I S, is the world's largest ice shelf by volume. It helps regulate Antarctic, Antarctica's contribution to global sea level rise and water mass transformations within the sub ice shelf cavity produce globally important dense water masses. Rates of ice shelf basal melting are relatively low. However, as the production of cold, approximately minus 1.9 C, and dense high salinity shelf water over the Weddell Sea continental shelf isolates the ice shelf from large-scale inflow of warm water. Okay, so let's pause there for a moment to kind of set up the situation. What they're saying here is that this, this water is very cold, so any basal melting of the ice itself is, is not really happening at any um, higher rate. In fact, it's rather low. Part of why that is is that there is very cold, very dense uh, water in the area that basically helps uh, protect that ice shelf from any possible from any uh, intrusion inflow of warm water, or certainly any large intrusion of warm water. However, nevertheless, a narrow inflow, narrow inflow of relatively warm, about minus 1.4 C, modified warm deep water, which is abbreviated MWDM. So modified warm deep water that hugs the western flank of Berkner Bank is observed to reach Rhone ice front. Although the processes governing how it circulates and what happens are uncertain. Here we present the first observations taken within the ice shelf cavity along this warm water inflow using the Autosub Long Range Autonomous Underwater Vehicle. We observe a core of modified warm deep water with a southwestward velocity of 4 centimeters per second. Okay, 4 centimeters per second that reaches at least 18 kilometers into the sub ice cavity. So you have four meters per second reaching at least 18 kilometers into the sub ice cavity. The hydrographic properties are spatially heterogeneous, giving rise to temporal variability that is driven by tidal advection. Okay. Tidal advection uh, can really influence uh, many aspects uh, in nearshore oceanography. I'll have more to say about that uh, from a personal perspective in a bit. The highest rates of turbulent dissipation are associated with the warmest modified warm deep water with the vertical eddy diffusivity reaching, and I think, you know, I've got to explain something here. They have 
10-4M2S-1, uh, where the water column is fully turbulent. Okay. I think they forgot to put a letter here. In, what they're trying to say is 10 to the minus 4. You know, in the old days, before we had things of, you know, where we had the word processes and where we had superscripts, subscripts, you know, fonts, italicized, etc. If we wanted to indicate an exponential power, if we were using base 10, we would put the capital letter E. So if you read, uh, saw something, you know, 3.7, you know, times 10 E6, that would be 3.7 times 10 to the 6. So what they probably should have had here was 10 E minus 4, which meant 10 to the minus 4. If you wanted it to indicate uh, the natural base, base E, then you would see in capital letters EXP. Capital E, capital X, capital P, which means exponent. And that meant like E to the minus 4, whatever. And then they say, you know, square meters per second, where the water column is fully turbulent, meaning lots of mixing going on. Mixing efficiency is close to the uh, canonical, or canonical, I, I never know how to say that word, the canonical value of 0 0.2. Modeling sug studies suggest that the modified warm deep water may become the dominant water mass beneath frizz in our changing climate, you know, providing, you know, what's going on here. Okay. What is meant by diffusivity? Well, diffusivity arises from diffusion. Diffusion in general terms is when you have a substance and the substance wants to, you know, is the process by which a substance of whatever the concentration is, and that concentration has a tendency to spread out evenly. For example, you know, have a really pungent odor contained within a, you know, some vessel, at, you know, high concentration. You go in one corner of the room, you open up this container, and in the opposite corner of the room, you don't really smell anything, but what happened after, you know, several minutes, perhaps, however, depends on the concentration gradient, you suddenly start smelling that odor. That's because it is diffusing throughout the space. Diffusivity is a measure of basically the fusion, but it's really relating the concentration gradient to the flux. Now you have heard me say that, you know, before that flux is, you know, a concentration of whatever it may be per unit area per or volume per unit time. Okay. So diffusivity is a flux proportionality uh, measure that relates the concentration to the flux. In other words, and the units are given as square meters per second. That's the typical, typically accepted SI units. Now, when we're talking about diffusing, you know, and a flux, we're talking about this concentration moving normal or perpendicular to the area. You know, we're talking about square meters, so it's moving perpendicular to that surface per unit time. Now, tidal advection, diffusivity. For my master's research, I examined how, how tidal advection modified the food forage fields of uh, salmon fry. And I typically, uh, specifically, I was looking at chum salmon fry. From that work, actually be, became the basis for, uh, for my uh, doctoral uh, research. And in my doctoral research, 
I was calculating the diffusivity coefficient in figuring out the turbulence and the mixing going on in the, uh, the body of water that where, uh, my study site was. That research also led, you know, it served a big portion of the work I did up in the Arctic Ocean when we are trying to come up with uh, heat diffusivity values within the water column and dissipating uh, to the atmosphere. So uh, imagine you have a nice flat ocean surface and you want to calculate the rate of heat diffusion or flux to the atmosphere. There's your square meter. The heat goes vertically through that surface area in a perpendicular manner from the ocean into the atmosphere. So um, that's basically what they're getting at here. Now, the interesting thing here is the same 10 to the minus 4 square meters per second. Well, you have 100 centimeters per meter. You have, if you take a meter and you square it, you have a square meter. So if you have 100 meters, 100, excuse me, 100 centimeters and you square it, you get 10,000 centimeters per square meter. Well, 10,000 is 10 to the 4. So now if you flip it around, this is basically the same that they're measuring diffusivity in centimeters per second. That's what they're saying here. Now this uh, 0 0.2, that's kind of a, a minimum value to get, uh, and, that, and that's referring to the diffusivity coefficient. That's kind of a, a minimum value where we see noticeable uh, turbulent and uh, fluxing going on. So I just want to kind of explain to you what the diffusivity uh, coefficients are, are about. And they're coefficients, they're, they're not really constants. Yes, it's a numerical value that you s s solve for and calculate, but it's always changing, so it's not necessarily a constant. Still, it tells us important information. So what are the key points? First, observations with an autonomous underwater vehicle beneath their own ice shelf, Antarctica, along the modified warm deep water inflow path. So this is new information being found. The inflow velocity averages, hey, four centimeters per second. And the hydrographic properties show strong spatial variability that is subject to tidal evection. Notice the tidal evection, the moving back and forth, is going to impact this inflow velocity. And I can pretty much tell you that... Uh, Talk about reaching 18 kilometers in, that's probably going to be when uh, the tidal is moving inwards. So it's helping to transport that in. Turbulent mixing is elevated for the warmest modified warm deep water with eddy diffusivity values reaching uh, 10 to the minus 4 square meters per second. Or centimeter per, se squares per second. Okay. The Filchinarone ice shelf is the largest floating extension of the Antarctic ice sheet by volume. The ocean beneath it is cold and dense, thus little ocean-driven melting occurs at its base. Right? Climate models predict that a significant shift in ocean circulation within the sub-ice shelf cavity may occur within the coming century with large-scale inflows of warm water. Highly elevated basal melt rates and significant consequences for global sea rise. Understanding the complex ice ocean interactions that occur beneath the frizz is therefore critical. At present, only a single narrow inflow of warm water is observed along the Rhone ice front. The processes controlling this warm inflow are poorly understood. And here we present the first observations from the inflow region obtained using the uh, unmanned uh, vehicle. Or in the old days, uh, yeah, the ROV, right, remotely operated 
vehicles. We observed that the flow of warm water into the cavity extends at least 18 kilometers and is highly patchy in nature with isolated maxima in ocean temperature that are moved around by the tides. Vertical mixing is strongest where the ocean is warmest. That's because you have a greater difference. You know, if it's warmest and you got cold, really cold water, you have a, a, the greatest possible temperature difference that leads to mixing. And that's the fusion. The fusion is mixing, really. Contributing diffusing and eroding the warm water signature. In other words, you have really warm water, really cold water. They mix, and the sum value in between. Well, that sum value in between is not going to be as the warm value that was originally there. So that was meant by eroding the warm water signature. And more research is needed. Okay. Why is this important? Why am I sharing this with you? If you have this inflow of warm water, it's going to start eroding the bottom of the ice. If this inflow of warm water starts increasing, you're going to increase the rate at which you start eroding the bottom of the ice. And everyone knows about Thwaites Glacier, Pine Island, right? All the other glaciers. Uh, you know, ice sheets in Antarctica I've discussed with you and that scientists really keep an, an eye on. We don't hear too much about the Rhone ice shelf, but we're going to start hearing a lot more of it. If this warming starts to increase, if the inflows of warm water start to increase to the point that this shelf is in danger and breaks off, it's the world's largest ice shelf by volume. Even if portions of it break off and they get swept up into lower latitudes, i.e. towards the equator and warmer waters where they start to melt. And we know what that means to global sea levels. They start to rise. So it is, which of course is, would not be a very good thing, you know, adding more sea level rise, and we know the issues with that. So it's good that there is research looking at this ice shelf. This is yet another ice mass from Antarctica that we need to be paying closer attention to. Yet, another signal of consequences of warming oceans. Right now, it seems to be protected, but what's that old saying? You just get that one little crack, and then that little crack gets split wider and wider until you have an inflow. So this one little inflow may be that one little crack that can lead to significantly larger amounts of warm water flowing in and then eroding the ice that could lead to its collapse. This is something we need to keep an eye on. So, there you have it. We'll talk soon. Thank you for your time.